Hi everyone, um, welcome back. So uh, today I would like to talk about uh, some uh, very interesting patterns that people have been talking about uh, for a long time, patterns uh, of, of species distributions around the world. Um, much of uh, today's talk is going to be on tetrapods. Uh, and for those of you who are uh, uh, not aware of tetrapods, uh, tetrapods are basically uh, four-legged, four-limbed vertebrates. So fishes are not included in, uh, in tetrapods. Um, tetrapods typically consist of amphibians, mammals, squamates, turtles, crocodiles, and birds, right? Uh, and of course, in each of these groups, there have been uh, limb reduction and limblessness, but that is a derived character. Uh, but uh, basically, this whole group is collectively called tetrapods. Now, uh, now the question is, uh, when it comes to the tetrapod diversity in India, uh, where did they come from? When did they arrive in India? Uh, what is the origin of India's tetrapod fauna? So that is uh, the question that we'll try to address today. And we will look at two processes in biogeography, dispersal and vicariance, uh, to understand uh, the, the current distribution of tetrapods in India. Um, now, this uh, talk is, is basically based on a review article that I published recently in January in Frontiers of Biogeography. Uh, it has the same title as the uh, title of this talk, Dispersal versus Vicarians, the Origin of India's Extant Tetrapod Fauna. By extant, I mean species that are present today in India or any, any landmass, right? Uh, whereas extinct would be something that was long gone. Um, so I'll predominantly talk about this particular paper and, uh, and allude to this paper that was also published from the lab uh, in, uh, in January this year uh, by my student Chinta. Uh, okay, so before I get into the details, uh, let's first understand what is uh, dispersal and vicariance, right? Uh, what we are really interested in is understanding species distributions over time and space. Basically, why are species distributed the way they are. So certain species have wide distributions, certain species have very restricted distribution. How does this come about? Um, and what are the historical processes that have shaped species distribution? So that's basically the area of biogeography. And in biogeography, two Historical processes are often invoked. One is dispersal and other one is vicariance. And often they are contrasted as competing processes right, to explain spatial and temporal pattern of, of biodiversity uh, on the planet. Uh, so what is vicariance? Uh, so vicariance and dispersal are the two major schools, one might say, of, in by geography. Uh, according to Vicarian school, uh, biodiversity is generated when a widely distributed ancestral species gets isolated into smaller units due to the emergence of a barrier between them. Right? And uh, this barrier could be, you know, uplifting of mountain range, thereby isolating a widely distributed uh, species into subpopulations. Uh, it could be uh, continental drift, 
so basically this big landmass gets split and then begins to move apart so the barrier then is the ocean between the two land masses uh, it could also be climate change in the intervening area uh, resulting in a situation where species adapted to similar climates get isolated right and eventually they speciate and we have two different species so that is the 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 vicarian school the dispersal school basically says that subpopulation of an ancestral species disperses across pre-existing barrier becomes isolated and eventually uh, evolves into a different species right uh, now the question is uh, how do we distinguish between the two scenarios after this speciation event has already occurred because they look similar um, the question uh, then one should be asking is when did the dispersal actually occur did it occur before the emergence of barrier or after the emergence of barrier so you know this would be before the emergence of the barrier the species expands its range so this is not exactly dispersal it expands its range to all the suitable habitat and and then you have the barrier emerging here the species is on uh, on one side of the barrier the barrier is already there right and then it disperses across the barrier so when did the isolating barrier emerge is uh, is the key here okay now uh, dispersal was long invoked as the predominant process to explain uh, global distributional patterns and uh, if you go back to the oldest sort of biogeography uh, literature uh, people talk about centers of uh, of origin uh, these are basically areas where uh, you know groups certain taxonomic groups have high diversity and uh, such areas were thought to be the center in which those taxonomic groups evolved originated and then they dispersed to other parts of the world so dispersal was was long thought to be the predominant process that explained distributional patterns uh, so the centers of origins of different groups would be in different parts of the world and so forth now uh, back in 1912 alfred wagner came up with the the continental drift theory right so he basically postulated that you know all the continents were together this is the gondwanan landmass uh, the southern continents uh, all of these were together they sort of fit in together like a jigsaw puzzle uh, of course his uh, uh, the, the conclusions he came up with were based on you know similarity of rock type fossil um, you know, geological structures and fossils that were shared across these different land masses right so he said that all of these land masses were once together and they split apart now when he proposed this uh, he was ridiculed people said you're stupid uh, um, and uh, uh, you know he basically died uh, before continental drift was widely accepted and that happened in the in the 50s with the acceptance of continental drift it became apparent uh, that vicarians could be an important uh, force here right so uh, you have species distributed across these different uh, land masses while they were all together and when the land masses separate you know populations of these species get isolated and then you have different species in different land masses so this would be vicarians as opposed to species evolving in a particular uh, landmass and then dispersing uh, across the barrier to another landmass that would be dispersal um, anyway so in the context of uh, of uh, 
Plate tectonics, continental drift, India is really very, very interesting. Why is it so? Well, India was one of the Gondwanan landmasses, right? It was part of Gondwana. Way back in, uh, 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 way back uh, 200 million years ago. Uh, and up, up there is Laurasia. Uh, and if you go further back, all of this was together. It was called Pangaea and then the Pangaea split into Laurasia and Gondwana. And around 170 million years ago, Gondwana began to uh, break apart. Uh, one of the earliest splits was uh, the, the uh, uh, split between East and West Gondwana, right? Uh, West Gondwana constitutes was con is constituted by Africa and South America. Uh, East Gondwana was the rest, right? Uh, Madagascar, India, uh, Antarctica, and uh, and Australia. And then India and Madagascar separate from each other around 85 million years ago. Um, this is between. 80 to 90 million years ago so I just put the, the average here and this by the way the actual initiation of uh, the split between East and West Gondwana is started at around uh, 160 million years ago and at about 120 to 110 million years ago it was complete separation so there's still some debate on when exactly this separation happened anyway uh, now, after India separates from Madagascar, India begins to move towards Asia. And at 65 million years ago, uh, another little Gondwanan fragment splits from India, and that uh, and that is the island of Seychelles, right, uh, which is in the Arabian Sea. <clears throat> and around six, uh, 65. Uh, a, a bit after 65 million years ago, you also have the mass extinction, and we'll we'll come back to that in a bit. Okay, um, then 55 million years ago, India then uh, collides with the Eurasian plate, and eventually, at 35 million years ago, India merges with with uh, Eurasia. Now this. Uh, fascinating journey of India from Gondwana to Eurasia uh, has really captivated the attention of biogeographers and what it really tells us that India potentially could have carried Gondwanan elements from the southern continent all the way to Asia and upon collision with Asia these Gondwanan elements then dispersed out of India, right? And this is something which is called the out of India hypothesis or the biotic ferry model, right? So India basically carries Gondwanan elements to Asia and eventually these elements disperse out of India. And of course, Asian elements disperse into India. So there's faunal exchange. And the, the the whole the, the whole area that studies how plate tectonics has uh, shaped distribution of species across the globe or at least you know in the southern continents uh, is termed Gondwana biogeography. All right, uh, I also want to. Uh, at this point, uh, clarify that when I say, uh, in the Indian context, when I say Gondwanan forms or Gondwanan elements or Gondwanan lineages, I re am referring to uh, lineages that have existed in India since before the breakup of Gondwana, right? So, things that were there then and exist in India to this day. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the definition of Gondwanan forms, Gondwanan elements, lineages, etc. Et uh, and also, 
uh, when I say India, I, I mean Indian plate. So basically, the the I don't I don't mean India as the political uh, entity. Uh, what I mean is the Indian plate, which includes Sri Lanka. So this is the Gondwanan fragment that 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 broke apart from Gondwana and then merged with Asia. Right. So it excludes Indus plains, Gangetic plains. You know, and much of uh, the rest of India. Now, biogeographers have often commented that you know this whole region is biogeographically unique in in that it has species composition quite different from the rest of uh, Southeast Asia. If you if you uh, have read a little bit of biogeography, um, you know India is placed in the Oriental by geographical realm and this realm is further divided into many sub-regions and one of them is the Indian sub-region. Um, so, you know, by geographically this is also quite distinct. Okay, fine. So, as I said, India, even though it's in, is, is placed in the Oriental realm um, or uh, Indo-Malayan uh, realms, that's what sometimes people call it. Uh, but geographically, it is quite distinct uh, because it consists of these ancient Gondwanan elements that um, traveled with India while India was drifting across Indian Ocean and on collision with Asia, these elements then dispersed out of India. Uh, some of them did not move out of India, those are called the Gondwanan relics. And then you have intrusive elements that came into India from, from Asia all, all, and also all the way from Africa. Okay. So one of the fundamental questions in, in Indian biogeography really is, you know, what proportion of India's biota falls in these two broad categories and a lot of work in my lab has con has been focused on trying to address this question. All right, now um, how did I really get interested in the whole Gondwana biogeography out of India hypothesis? Um, uh, well, the paper that really inspired me uh, was this paper by Bosovit and Milinkovic, uh, where they talk about, you know, endemic frog groups in India, how, you know, these are uh, uh, really ancient groups that have, you know, their sister lineages in Madagascar. Um, and uh, and, when, and some of these lineages upon uh, India's uh, collision with Asia dispersed out of India. Um, so this was uh, the one of the first molecular evidence supporting this scenario. Okay. Now I should mention that uh, a very well-known Indian biogeographer, Mani, had already talked about these things, right? But that was largely based about, uh, largely based on species distribution maps, taxonomy, uh, and it it was not rigorously tested using uh, phylogenetic methods. Um, whereas uh, Boswitz and Boswitz and Milinkovic's uh, work uh, was one of the first papers. There were many other papers at that point in time. And so uh, I got really fascinated by this idea, you know, that drifting Indian plate carried elements from the southern continents to the north, uh, and, and then these elements then dispersed into Asia. Uh, the whole hype out of uh, India hypothesis, the biotic ferry model, and all that. So I, I wrote a couple of uh, um, uh, review articles on this and 
based on the molecular data that was published at that point in time. So the first one came out in 2006 and the second one in 2009. Uh, I will come back to this later, these two papers, uh, because what we understand of uh, the origin of Indian biota is very different, at least the tetrapod. Uh, fauna is, is very different from what I had written in these papers then. Okay, now much of the work uh, that was done in the past with respect to Gondwana by geography was based on distribution maps, right? So if you have a species that is distributed in South America, Africa, Madagascar, and India. <coughs> How do you explain this disjunct distribution? And people said, hey, wait a minute, all these continents were, all these land masses were together, and it was called Gomana. So probably this species evolved when these continents were together and then uh, or this lineage evolved when these continents were together and when they separated they um, uh, then evolved into different species but they are all related right so this is the classic vicarians model and these are the barriers the oceanic barriers that separate them today uh, however it's plausible that the group may be evolved in Africa and then dispersed to these different land masses, right? And that would be the, dis the dispersal model. How do you distinguish between the two? Uh, molecular data is very useful to address this question. Um, now, if you sample these species from these, these different land masses, sequence a bunch of uh, genes, build a phylogeny, then the tree topology, the phylogenetic tree, should be congruent with the sequence of vicarious event, uh, basically sequence of continental breakup, and also the node age, node ages should correspond to the time when those uh, land masses separated from each other, right? Uh, so, so that's the whole whole idea here. And in fact, uh, it's just illustrated here in a in a different format. Um, what you have here is, um, you know, you sample the species from the different land masses. Um, and we know that the earliest breakup, earliest separation happened between West Gondwana and East Gondwana. So species sampled from here and here should separate out in the phylogeny. Right, so Madagascar and India, Africa and South America. And this date should correspond to the time when the separation, geological separation happened. Followed by the next separation, the, which is between India and Madagascar. And once again, this separation should correspond to the time when these two land masses separated from each other. Okay, so then we have uh, India colliding with Asia and these Gondwanan elements then dispersing into Asia, right? Uh, the India's collision with Asia starts at 55 and, and by 35 million years ago, it, uh, there is complete merger. But in between, I'm sure there must have been many land bridges and so on. So these dispersal events should be pretty recent. Right? So this is how molecular data, molecular phylogenetics is used to address some of these questions. Now, I was really fascinated by this uh, uh, 
this hypothesis. So we went about uh, testing this hypothesis using some of the groups in India, particularly groups that have circumtropical distribution, right? Uh, for example, uh, you have the hemidactylus geckos. They are found in South America, Africa, Madagascar, India. Uh, so all the former bone modern fragments. Uh, and when we built the phylogeny, we realized that uh, the Indian hemidactylus actually dispersed very recently, 35 to 40 million years ago, from Southeast Asia. So, they are not of monoanan origin, they, their distribution has not been shaped by uh, plate tectonic mediated vicarians. Right? The same was with many other groups of uh, squamates. I already talk, talked about Hemidactylus. Uh, another group uh, of geckos, uh, geckoella, the same story into India from Southeast Asia with skinks, the same story either from India or from Africa, but all of them recent dispersals into India after India had collided with Asia, right? So they are not ancient Gondwan and groups. Um, so these groups are more closely related to India. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the Indian groups are more closely related to ones from Southeast Asia rather than Madagascar, right? Okay, so then we begin to think what was really going on. Now, other scientists had also noticed the same uh, pattern where the distribution data suggests Gondwan in origin, but the molecular data suggests something else. Right? Here's an example of cichlid fishes. Again, they have pantropical distribution, South America, Africa, Madagascar, India. And if you look at the cichlid phylogeny, it matches perfectly with the sequence of the breakup of Gondwana. Right, so you have West Gondwana, East Gondwana split happening first and then split between South America and Africa, Madagascar and India. Right, so hey, this might be a Gondwanan element and its distribution probably has been shaped by plate tectonic mediated vicarians. However, when they built the molecular, uh, the, when they dated the phylogeny, they realized this radiation was very young. Right? The root age of the cichlid radiation is about 56, the, the oldest date they could get is about 56 million years, which is younger than India Madagascar split, much younger than the split between East and West Gondwana, that is Africa versus Indo-Madagascar, right? So, at that point I was like, okay, we should probably look at uh, global phylogenies of various groups and see what the dates uh, people have been reporting and uh, find out if uh, any of these groups, the, the root age predates these continental breakup or does it post-date continental breakup, right? Now, if uh, you have a situation where this, the molecular dating suggests that the divergence between species in these different landmasses, Africa, Madagascar and India correspond to the time when these landmasses separated from each other then you know, one can invoke vicarians. However, if the group is really young, if it has, gone, uh, if it has undergone uh, 
diversification recently, like the cyclades. Uh, then it is dispersal, right? So these, this particular diversification event is younger than the two major events that we are talking about, you know, suppression of India Madagascar and suppression of Africa and Indo Madagascar. Right, so it's a much younger radiation. Um, so I said, let's let's go back and look at uh, some of the uh, global phylogenies and look at the root age of these groups, taxonomic groups. If it is younger than these two vicarians events that we are looking for, then it is dispersal. It can't be vicarians. As simple as that. All right. So my first example is uh, from birds. Uh, quite a few papers have been published on birds, but what is really interesting is that pretty much all of them, the dates are quite consistent. Uh, let me explain to you what's on this slide the actual species names you don't have to really bother about uh, what you see is this huge clade here a huge group uh, these are the new new apes the modern birds and if you look at when they started diversifying the root age of the new apes diversification falls within what we call the cretaceous paleogene uh, transition, right? So that's when uh, we move from the Cretaceous, which is this part of uh, the of the of the of the time period, and then from there onwards you have the Paleogene. <clears throat> um, and India Madagascar separation, so that uh, India Madagascar separation is is shown in the dash line over here, you know, at about 85 million years ago. Yeah, so, um, but what's interesting is that none of these diversification events within the birds predates India Madagascar's separation. I'm not even going into the, the earlier vicarians event which is separation of, uh, of Africa from Indo-Madagascar, right? So that's at about 120 somewhere around here, right? So these are the two vicarians events we are interested in. But this group is much younger, the root age is much younger, right? And the root age falls in this Cretaceous Paleogene transition period, um, and that's also quite interesting. So, what's really happening here? Now, uh, fossil data. People have have noted that fossil data suggests something very inter uh, interesting. Um, we know that birds evolved in late Jurassic, okay, around 157 million years ago, uh, and underwent diversification throughout the Cretaceous. So the Cretaceous is about uh, from about 145 to 66 million years ago. Uh, that's when these lineages uh, underwent diversification. However, during KPG event only a few uh, so and these lineage, lineages were depleted during the KPG event now what is this KPG event this is the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction event right so that's when all the dinosaurs went extinct and uh, so during the KPG event many of these lineages went extinct only a few morphological forms survived to evolve into extinct lineages we see today. Okay. 
So in fact, other authors have also talked about it. There was a major extinction of archaic birds coinciding with KPG boundary, KPG transition, whatever you want to call it, Cretaceous, Paleogene uh, transition. So that's around here at 66 million years ago. Um, uh, so there's another author who who talks about uh, uh, how you know, most avian lineages were decimated at the end Cretaceous extinction, right? So when the Cretaceous period ended, that's when there was mass extinction, most uh, lineages went extinct, uh, along with all the dinosaurs. And after these mass extinctions, extinction, modern birds emerged. Right. So when we talk about uh, the most recent mass extinction, what comes to mind is, you know, dinosaurs went extinct. Well, a lot of other groups also uh, experienced mass extinction. It's just that they were not completely obliterated. A few lineages survived. All right. So what is this whole mass extinction all about? Now, if you look at the the history of Earth's biota, the last 600 million years, uh, there have been five major mass extinction events. And the most recent mass extinction event is the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, right? Also, in the past, it was called Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction or KT mass extinction. Now it is called the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction or the KPG mass extinction. Why did that happen? Well, it is believed that um, uh, you know, a meteor impact in uh, the Caribbean region uh, caused this mass extinction around 66 million years ago. And what it basically did was it obliterated all the dinosaurs um, And birds, by the way, are, 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 are part of the, the dinosaur lineage, uh, the dinosaur radiation, right? It, it's, they, are, they form one twig in the dinosaur radiation. So many of the birds also went extinct. Basically, uh, this extinction event resulted in anything more than 25 kgs in weight, you know, getting obliterated, right? So anything really large just went extinct. Okay, so in this case of birds, this is what happened. Um, the earliest bird fossil is from the late Jurassic uh, and the birds, went, uh, birds uh, underwent rapid radiation in the Cretaceous between 45 to 66 million years ago. Um, that's when, you know, dinosaurs were also very uh, species uh, and uh, then there was the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction at 66 million years ago. Basically that killed all the dinosaurs, uh, but in case of birds, a few lineages survived into the tertiary uh, and those lineages then diversified right so if you look at extant birds and go back in time to the common ancestor of extant birds by extant i mean birds that you see today right extinct is all of this extent is something that we see today. Now, if you go back in time, build a phylogeny, go back in time to, and, 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 and determine the age of the root node of extant birds, you realize that it is uh, younger than when India and Madagascar split from each other and um, Africa and Indo-Madagascar separated from each other, right? 
So the distribution of these lineages cannot be explained by plate tectonic mediated vicariates. In the Cretaceous, I'm sure bird distribution was mediated by these two major events. However, after all these lineages went extinct, the signature of these tectonic uh, event, events, uh, signature of how those tectonic events might have shaped distribution was the distributions of species was lost, right? So that's basically what we are at now. Uh, if you have groups that have undergone diversification more recently and if the root age of uh, the, the age of the root node of that diversification postdates these two vicarian events, then we can safely say that that particular group uh, dispersed into India. Okay, so I went on to then look at other groups distributed in, in, in India. Oh well, not just in India, around the world, but basically looking at um, global phylogenies of other groups. I already talked about birds, so I also looked at mammals, crocodiles, amphibians, squamates, and turtles, and I'm not going to get into the details of all that uh, uh, literature, uh, you can read the paper and get the feel of it, uh, but I'll just uh, talk about a couple of other examples and, and, and sum it up. Okay, uh, let's look at crocodiles. Now if you look at crocodiles, they are quite interesting because they exhibit something called morphological stasis and basically what does that mean if you look at crocodiles today they look like you know the crocodiles from way back in time right uh, oh i also wanted to point out that uh, so these are some of the papers that i refer to just exemplars actually i refer to a lot more papers but these are some papers that you might want to look into. Uh, in brackets are dates of the oldest known fossil for each of those groups. Right? Uh, crocodiles might actually go further back in time. This is probably what looks like the modern day genus Crocodilus. The, the oldest fossil of crocodilus. Anyway, uh, if you look at the crocodile phylogeny, uh, what do we see? Well, uh, this is a, a time tree, a dated phylogeny. Uh, so, you know, these nodes represent not just uh, the common ancestor or species. Uh, that is trend from the node, but also the time when these lineages split from each other. Um, the red arrows here represent the species found in India. You have the freshwater crocodiles, the saltwater crocodiles, and you know the Ganges gladial. If you look at when they all, when these groups diverge from each other, it is in early Eocene. Right, it does not correspond to the time when India and Madagascar separated from each other, which is somewhere here, and India, Madagascar from Africa is further back. Right, so these groups clearly dispersed into India. If you just look at the genus Crocodilus, uh, this is the genus that. Uh, it, shares morphological characters with many of the fossil forms, really old fossil forms. And that's why people often thought that, you know, this is a very ancient group, 
it is an ancient group it's just that many of those lineages just went extinct and there was morphological stasis and um, you know many of these uh, this genus today looks very similar morphologically to what we see in the fossils but anyway the authors then go on to say that uh, the most recent common ancestor of Crocodilus is far too recent for Vicarians via continental drift to explain the circum tropical distribution of this genus. Right? So basically, you know, they are ruling out Vicarians. If you look at mammals, it's again the same story. Out here is the KPG mass extinction event and much of the diversification in mammals has happened after uh, the KPG mass extinction right so just like in the birds there must have been many lineage, uh, lineages earlier May, most of them went extinct few survived the mass extinction event and then you had uh, major radiations post KPG mass extinction because there were so many open uh, niches out there. So clearly this radi uh, the mammalian radiation also does not correspond to the two vicarious events I was talking about. Uh, amphibians again the same story. Um, this line here is KPG. This is India Madagascar separation. Actually, let's look at this more closely. If you look at the species found in India, these are all in green here. And what's in blue is a species distributed in Africa, light blue is uh, Eurasia. This particular paper, Feng et al. had actually done uh, some biogeographic analyses and what they basically found is that many of the Indian groups actually dispersed from Eurasia or Africa. Right? But there is one frog lineage that has one one in origin and that is Nastica Petrakis. Uh, Nastica Petrakis is a very very interesting uh, frog lineage. Um, it's called the purple frog. It's a fusorial frog that uh, uh, emerges from the underground uh, once a year, mates lays eggs vanishes again right so for the longest time this frog was not known it was only in the early 2000s that this frog species was discovered now the closest relative of Nasica batrachus is uh, a family called Suglossidae that is confined to the island of Seychelles right now if you remember the island of Seychelles split from India around 65 to 66 million years ago while India was drifting towards Asia right so uh, this is classic sort of vicarious event so if you look at the the divergence between Nasica Petrakas and Su Suglasidae Su it correspond to this, corresponds to the time when the two land masses separated from each other right so its presence in India can be explained by Vicarians now if we look at the the Nasica Betrakus, Suglossid lineage 
and the rest of the African lineages because all of this is Africa, you know, the ancestral area is all Africa. If you look at the separation between these two clades, this time also corresponds to the time when East and West Gondwana separated from each other. Right? So, this is one of the few examples of Vicarians uh, mediated distribution of an ancient group in India. Um, among the amphibians, another group, the Sicilians, are also quite in ancient. Uh, this is work done uh, in, um, by, uh, by Chun, who was uh, a student in Delhi University in uh, Biju's lab. And uh, basically, if you look at uh, the Sicilian groups that are distributed in India and go back in time and look at the, the root age of that radiation, um, it, it falls way before the two Vicarians events we were talking about, right? So Sicilians are probably another group that uh, conform to this uh, uh, tectonic mediated vicarians. So in my lab we have been, as I said earlier, we have been working on uh, many uh, squamates. Squamates are basically lizards and snakes uh, and uh, we have been doing a lot of work on, um, on ligosomines. So if you look at uh, skinks, uh, they consist of two major groups, uh, actually three groups, but the, the, these two groups are the most species. You have the ligosomines and, uh, uh, and the subfamily Cincinnae. Uh, ligosomines we knew all dispersed into India. Uh, they have largely laureation distribution. Uh, Cincinnati, on the other hand, have gone on in distribution, right? So we were like, okay, maybe you know this is an ancient, probably an ancient group um, whose distribution was mediated by plate tectonic event. Something else that's interesting about subfamily Cincinnati is that many of these um, species in this subfamily are limbless. Now, if you're limbless and if you've seen some of these limbless lizards, you know, they don't really disperse. I mean, they, 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 they can't really, they, they, are, they are fusorial, so, uh, and uh, they're not very fast uh, on the surface, so they can't really disperse very far. So they are probably tied down to the landmass where they are. So Vicarians probably would better explain their distribution and they have a Gunwanan distribution. Now when we constructed the time tree, uh, this is what we expected if it was classic Vicarian scenario, right? Uh, a split between Sinsins from Africa and the rest of Asia. Uh, uh, Asia and Madagascar, which is which would be quite ancient, that would be East and West Gondwana. Uh, of course, this date, you know, I, I've been going back and forth between 160 and 120. Um, 160 is when the breakup began, and by 120, you know, the East and West Gondwana were completely separated. Um, and then you have uh, Madagascar separating from India, Seychelles and Sri Lanka. And then you have Seychelles separating from India and Sri Lanka and so on, right? So this is the kind of phylogeny we expected with these timelines for Vicarians to be supported, right? 
what we actually see is the dates are much younger. It's between 60 and 50 million years. It does not even fall within India Madagascar separation. Right? Um, that's the lower limit for India Madagascar separation, and you know that's the upper limit for India Madagascar separation. Interestingly, the Indian species are not even sister to Malagasy species, they are sister to African species. Right? So this appears like again a dispersal event. Um, however, there is another group of squamates which exhibits an interesting pattern and these are the blind snakes. Now people who have been working on blind snakes in the past uh, talked about how it's an ancient group and you know Gondwana breakup might have shaped their distribution. People uh, like Vidal at the Paris Museum had talked about it. Uh, so we undertook a phylogenetic analysis of, of this group. Uh, much of the sequences were already published. We added in the Indian mm, groups and did a biogeographic analysis. Um, and this study was done by my uh, PhD student Chinta. Uh, and what we find is that the root, uh, age of the root node of, uh, of blind snakes uh, is actually quite old, right? It's, um, uh, it's way, it's, it's, it's around the time when East and West Gondwana separated from each other and the biogeographic analysis supports it, right? So you have the, the ancestral distribution of the, the, the root node, which is India, Madagascar and Africa. And then you have separation between Africa and India, followed by the separation between India and Madagascar. Uh, subsequently. So the group in India uh, that separated from the Malagasy uh, taxa uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a family called Geropilidae. Uh, now this definitely has Gondwana in origin. Right. Um, however, there have been many dispersals into India and I am not going to get into details. Look at this paper. Um, it has all the details. Um, so the, the, the take home message here really is that uh, in case of uh, the blind snakes, by the way, blind snakes are an early diverging lineage within the snake radiation. And within the blind snake radiation you have some lineages that are really quite old uh, and their distribution in the different land masses can be explained by plate tectonic mediated vicariance. So I'm going to summarize uh, the, the results of uh, my uh, review here. Um, so I basically looked at many different papers and the idea was to try and find out what was the age of the root node and if that age was less than or if that age date was very recent then one would invoke dispersal if that date corresponded to the time when the major land masses separated then one could invoke vicarians right um, and we looked at all the major tetrapod lineages amphibians mammals um, 
squamates, turtles, crocodilians, and birds. Right. Uh, this figure needs a little bit of explanation. So what do we have here? There's a scale here that's present day, today, and it scale goes, time scale goes all the way to 200 million years ago. This line here is the KPG mass extinction. This should actually be KPG. Uh, and that's around the time when India and Seychelles separated from each other. Uh, this column here, this gray column here represents India Madagascar separation between eight, uh, between uh, 80 to 90 million years ago. This gray column, white gray column represents the separation of Africa or West Gondwana from East Gondwana, Africa and Indo-Madagascar 160 to 120 million years ago. Uh, the dark uh, filled bars uh, represent the, the age of the root node of various taxonomic groups. Including the the credible the, the confidence interval for that uh, uh, date, right? And as you can and then, then the open bars represent studies where people have actually done biogeographic analyses and uh, shown when those groups dispersed into India, right? And if you if you see this, much of the Indian fauna, tetrapod fauna, basically dispersed into India because they fall outside of these two bars or these two columns, right? They they are they are very recent. Um, the exceptions are just three groups, the blind snakes, Sicilians and Nasica betrakas that I was talking about, you know, uh, where Nasica betrakas is found in India and uh, Suglos is in, uh, in uh, Seychelles. Um, and then this was the divergence between the Nasica Betrakas Suglosid lineage and the rest of the frogs. Uh, and that goes back to the time when Africa and uh, Indo Madagascar separated. In case of Sicilians, again, the age of the root node is quite old, it falls within. Africa into Madagascar separation, blind snakes, same story. Um, there is one uh, divergence that uh, that's uh, falls between uh, that falls in the range of uh, um, East and West Gondwana separation, and the, the next one is between uh, the separation between India and Madagascar. So there are just three, these three lineages um, among all the tetrapod groups that conform to plate tectonic mediated vicariance. Everything else. The diversification is really young. They all moved into India uh, post KPG. Now, what? Uh, so, the, so what? What the, the take-home message basically here is that the distribution of only three tetrapod lineages, that is one frog family, Nasica batracus, then you have the Sicilians and one blind snake family, Geropilidae, was shaped by plate tectonic mediated vicariance. The rest is all dispersal.
Now, if you if you total up the number of species across all these different groups, you realize that these th three families actually, or these three lineages actually consist of very few species. And basically 99% of Indian tetrapods dispersed into India. Right? Or, 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 or lineages that led to 99% of Indian tetrapods dispersed into India. What happened here then? So basically, um, mass extinction got rid of most of the ancient groups, right? So when we talk about the KT mass extinction or KPG mass extinction, we think about how dinosaurs got wiped out. But KPG mass extinction had a huge impact on, on, on birds. There's fossil evidence to support that on, on uh, squamates. So, you know, it's not just dinosaurs that went extinct. Many of these groups also went extinct. The difference being dinosaurs got obliterated. In case of these other groups, few lineages survived. And post KPG, they underwent diversification. So their diversification post-dated the two Vicarians events that we are talking about. What about fossil data from India? Uh, so people have noted that the Upper Cretaceous fossil assemblages include numerous Gondwanan uh, taxa with uh, numerous taxa with Gondwanan affinities. Right. In contrast, the lower Eocene, which is between 56 to 34 million years ago, comprises mainly of forms from Eurasia. Right. So, older elements were all Gondwanan. This went extinct, were replaced by elements from Eurasia, dispersals from Eurasia. So, the elements that had Gunwanan origin all went extinct. Uh, in fact, Chatterjee points out that as India drifted from Gondwana to Eurasia, the fossil fauna exhibits a change from Gondwanan to Asian affinity. Now, there is something else that uh, might have contributed to the extirpation of of uh, Gondwanan elements in India. Uh, one that is often cited, uh, sometimes discussed, is the fact that India was uh, was uh, India and Madagascar were were a landmass, you know way back when India was part of Gondwana and uh, and then India Madagascar separated from Africa and then India separated from Africa. Now since India's separation from 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 uh, Madagascar, Madagascar has pretty much stayed in the same place but India traversed all through the Indian Ocean before colliding with Asia, right? So this uh, journey might have uh, uh, imposed a lot of climatic stress on, on, on uh, the, the biota in India and that might have caused some extinction. Uh, this is debatable but uh, definitely the other important factor that might have compounded extinction in India uh, is Deccan volcanism, right? So 66 million years ago, we had uh, mass extinction, the most recent mass extinction, this, um, the, the KPG mass extinction that happened because of the meteor impact in the Caribbean region. But around the same time, 
there was huge volcanic activity in the Deccan region while India was still uh, uh, moving towards Asia, right? And some people have actually said that maybe the volcanic act activity has got something to do with the meteor impact, but that's a debate for a different day. But any case, uh, this volcanic activity must have also contributed to mass extinction, not just in India, but everywhere else in the world and people have also been debating about this. What did this volcan volcanic activity do? So basically you have a huge lava flow that occurred during that time and this lava flow extends about 500,000 square kilometers and in some areas it is as thick as 2 kilometers. So this must have like completely wiped out all the Gurdwanan elements in India. So when India sort of arrives at Asia, it was a clean slate. So I guess this uh, is probably what, I mean, this is my renditioning of what might have happened uh, around uh, 170 million years ago. Uh, Kundwana begins to split and what I have sh shown here are two species, a red species and a yellow species that was distributed across, widely distributed across Gondwana, right? And then uh, Gondwana uh, breaks apart. Uh, these species get isolated and this is classic Icarians. So now you would expect them to be different species but related to each other. Then at 65 million years, 66 million years actually, not 65, um, there's the KP, uh, uh, KPG mass extinction that results in... We have the KPG mass extinction um, which results in you know these uh, species going extinct in certain land masses right and where they went extinct is is probably was probably a random event uh, for example you know uh, marsupials had a much wider distribution across all these land masses but probably went extinct everywhere else except Australia. Uh, in India of course you know multiple reasons for why lineages might have gone extinct so this is probably completely depopulated. Uh, in Africa you have uh, this ancient clade called Afrotherians uh, that probably were more widely distributed, but random event went extinct in some of these other land masses, but were only present, uh, managed to hold on uh, in Africa. And once, uh, and in in a, in a later date, these then these lineages then dispersed to other parts of the world. So, for example, marsupials are also found in. Uh, South America, but that's a more recent dispersal. Similarly, Afrotherians have also dispersed from Africa to other parts of the world. Okay, so I'm not able to move the cursor. Here we go. Yeah. So, so to <clears throat> sum, sum it up, uh, overall, the recent molecular studies suggest that the extent tetrapods underwent post KPG diversification must much after 
India Madagascar separation. Uh, late Cretaceous tetrapod groups experienced KPG mass extinction and in India Deccan volcanism and probably climate change caused further extinctions. Uh, at the beginning of Paleogene, um, so this is immediately after Cretaceous, Indian plate had probably lost much of the tetrapod diversity it had in the Cretaceous. Right? And this facilitated dispersal of tetrapods uh, into India post KPG mass extinction from Eurasia and elsewhere. Of course, then one might say that tetrapods are probably not a good system to study Gondwana by geography. Now, does this mean that India does not harbor any plant or animal lineages with Gondwanan history? I don't think so. Uh, probably we are not targeting the right groups. Right? Uh, tetrapods are definitely not the right group to study Gondwana by geography. However, however, there is something very interesting. The three tetrapod groups of Gondwanan history in India uh, are all fossorial. So they dig into the soil and, and then they spend most of their time in the soil. They are not out on the, on the surface. Now it has been noted that uh, stable and predictable fossorial environments shelter species from dramatic above ground environmental changes. Right? Uh, uh, when you have all these volcanic events and uh, harsh environmental events outside, probably some of these fossorial animals were able to survive, whereas all the terrestrial ones just went extinct. In this regard, soil invertebrates might be a good system to address this question. You know, again, because they are small, fossorial, and so on, and, and they are shielded from extreme conditions on the ground, uh, 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 you know, uh, on the surface. So clearly, this uh, this exercise that I have sort of walked you through um, needs to be undertaken on other Indian biota, particularly plants and invertebrates, of course, and I should also point out that in case of invertebrates, uh, one of my earlier PhD students, uh, Johnny Joshi, who is now at uh, CCMB, uh, looked at uh, centipedes, and in centipedes we do find ancient lineages um, that appears to have one one an origin. Right. So, invertebrates, I think, are the way to go, especially the ones that are in the soil. Okay, so I think that is the last slide. Oh, well, before I end, um, I started the talk by, uh, you know, mentioning these two papers, how I was so impressed by um, the whole out of India hypothesis, even one and origin, and, and all that. And um, when we look at uh, the literature, also the work done in my lab, one realizes that in case of tetrapods, the whole one and origin hypothesis or the plate tectonic mediated vicarian scenario falls apart. Right? So, what's written in these two papers now basically get nullified by what I just published. Um, so, I just wanted to flag that issue. Alright, so with that, I end my talk. Uh, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. And uh, I'll come up with other talks in future. Thank you for your time. Hey, Andy.